Alibaba reported results this past week and I put out a first look for you guys which you guys found very helpful but now we're going to go into a multi-video deep dive where I'm going to dive into all of the important segments and take a look at the overall opportunity that exists in the market today. So that's what we're going to cover in this video so smash that like button and subscribe if you're new. You're watching more money. Let's get it. What's up guys and welcome back to the channel where the mission here is to help a thousand people achieve financial independence much sooner and as you guys already know Alibaba released financial results on Thursday this past week and the market really enjoyed the results and I think what they really took away from this is that despite the challenging economic environment that exists with operating in China Alibaba has been able to navigate through this in very exceptional ways. And so without further ado, let's dive right into it. So you can see here that in this video, we're going to cover the two major segments that make up, I think, around 76% of their revenue. And that is their China commerce business and their international commerce business. But as you can see, just as a reminder for you guys, Alibaba has a huge assortment of businesses. So they have their online commerce business, but they also have their local consumer businesses, which is like Uber and Uber Eats. They have their digital media businesses, which is, you know, they make films. They have a YouTube equivalent. They also have their logistics network and their logistic network goes and helps their China commerce segment. They also have the cloud business and they have DingTalk, which is very similar to zoom communications but with that let's dive into the first slide which is china commerce so that consists of of course t-mall and their grocery apparatus which they refer to as retailer 1p here so you can see here that overall china commerce revenue was up 18 percent year over year however notice that their adjusted ebitda margin of 31 percent is actually 15 percent lower year over year so it's less profitable now part of the reason why it's less pro profitable is that they're moving into less profitable businesses they're moving into that grocery space so pay attention to that don't just look at the lower ebitda margin and just automatically assume that the business is getting worse but the one thing that i did want to highlight is notice that red box there what i'm really trying to show there is that alibaba as a whole continues to be a one segment business but notice that cloud actually had an adjusted EBITDA margin of two percent it's becoming profitable as they achieve economies of scale and this is why I talk so much about what happens in China because what happens in China is important for Alibaba and it's the reason why international expansion is so important. So that's why when we look at Alibaba as a whole, one of the things that we try to gauge is how successful are they doing internationally. Now, this isn't a place that I've been historically very bullish on because they're facing tough competition in Southeast Asia with their Lazada brand, with C Limited or their Shopee brand. They're facing tough economics with Trendyol in Turkey and Pakistan is not necessarily considered a developing economy with their Duraz business. So overall, it's tough economics internationally for Alibaba. However, I'm glad that they're still pushing ahead, especially with that Southeast Asia opportunity. But now moving back into this, you can see that those other businesses have brought the overall adjusted EBITDA margin down to 15%. And what that really reflects is that they're generating revenue and the revenue is growing. You can see that revenue year over year change for each of the segments is up, but these are unprofitable segments. And so overall, they're bringing the adjusted EBITDA margin down. That doesn't mean that you don't continue to run them because the hopes are that these businesses are going to become profitable in the future. And one of the ones that is starting to get profitable, you can see is that 2% adjusted EBITDA margin for Alibaba Cloud. Now, some of you guys might want a reminder what exactly is China commerce? What businesses consist of China's commerce? And that's what I try to do on this channel. I try to sort of break it all down to you in the nitty gritties. And so you can see here that China commerce consists of marketplace, retailer, and wholesale. So in marketplace, that's where they got their Tmall and Taobao. Those are those first two there. But then right below there, you have their Tao Sai Sai and Taobao deals. And that's their new growing segments that I talk so much about. So I consider that the customer management segment. Yes, Alibaba has different names for the same things. We just have to deal with it. Now, with the retailer, you can see that that's what they consider more their direct sales. So they have Sun Heart in there. They have Alley Health. And the one that I'm most excited about is Fresh Hippo. That's that blue hippopotamus there. And the reason why I really love the Fresh Hippo brand is because it's not only grocery stores, but it's fast, quick service in an innovative way. And so you guys can go back into my Alibaba sort of like initiation type video where I did like that seven part series where I really dive deep into exactly what Fresh Hippo is. And if you haven't seen those, you guys really need to go see that video. It's on my main page as the Alibaba series. 
I truly believe in the Fresh Hippo brand. And then of course they have their 1688 brand, which is their wholesale brand. Funny thing is that their 1688 website, 1688.com is one of their oldest websites. And so they continue to run this wholesale business. Now, overall, you can see that China Commerce grew at 18%. That's that red underline there. But you can see that direct sales and other grew revenue at 43%. So direct sales and others is what's bringing them forward. And what that is, is a couple of things. Groceries continuing to grow. But the other thing is they incorporated Sun Art into their consolidated results. And so there's a little bit of an acquisition effect into their results in 2022. So it's not all just organic growth. That's essentially what I'm trying to get across to you. But notice overall that customer management, that's their biggest segment, Taobao and Tmall, it only really grew 3% a year. However, I actually think that's a great thing because I was so down on China that I actually thought that Taobao and Tmall would go backwards. Now we did see it go backwards in one quarter earlier in this year. So it's something that we have to continue looking at overall. If they continue these zero COVID policies, you're gonna probably see these segments go backwards. So just something to really pay attention to. The trajectory is not in the right direction, at least I don't think. So we'll see how this plays out. But they got saved by grocery. Also China Commerce Wholesale is up 17%. I didn't expect China Commerce Wholesale to be up so much. And just to put it into perspective, you can see here on this slide, this is sort of my five year annual growth expectation. So you can see I expect China Commerce Retail to grow overall at 18.4%. Uh, it grew at 18%, so very in line with expectations. But the interesting thing is China Commerce Wholesale grew at 17%, whereas I expected wholesale to grow at 11%. But the only thing that I do want to point out there is that one of the reasons why China Commerce retails revenues did grow at 18% is because they consolidated those Sun Art results. So without that, they actually went under expectation. So something to be aware of where growth is really slowing down. You can see these zero COVID policies actually having an impact. China is slowing down. We need to be aware of that and build that into our forecast going forward, which is why I'm going to build a totally new model and I'm going to release as part of this series. Now, this slide here is just a reminder of every one of the brands that falls into the segments. I just wanted to put this here just in case if you are unsure of it, you can freeze this later on and just go back and look at it. I highlighted some that are important. Okay, moving on. So for China Commerce, you can see that the story remains the same for customer management. They definitely experience slowing market conditions, higher competition, and in terms of profitability, they have been reinvesting capital support to support their merchant spend. And they say that by saying customer management revenue increased by 3% year over year, primarily due to single digit year over year growth in online physical goods, gross market value of Taobao and Tmall. Excluding unpaid orders, that resulted from slowing market conditions and increased competition, as well as our support to merchants. Now, with their direct sales, they say that direct sales grew primarily due to revenue contributed by their direct sales business, such as Sun Art, which they consolidated in October of 2020, Tmall Supermarket, and Fresh Hippo. So there's no real change to the story there. I expect grocery to continue to be strong. However, I could see grocery getting weaker if the China continues with their zero COVID policy. So again, be cautious. This isn't a perfect investment. It's never been so. Now, with their wholesale business, one of the reasons why they said that they grew 17% is because they attributed primarily to the increase in revenue from value added services to paying members and wholesale buyers. So I'm actually interested to learn more exactly about what these value added services are. And I hope as I go through their conference calls and all of their other materials, I'm gonna figure that out. So stay tuned. I am gonna to continue to do more research here. I really wanna know what they're doing to increase these revenues. And also value added services, they sound like something that go right down to the bottom line. So very interested to learn about what this high quality growth looks like. But as you can see from this chart, there's major profitability declines in China. And so they break it down into three items. So those three items are one, the decrease is primarily due to the increased investments in Taobao deals and Tao Sai Sai within their China commerce retail business and their increased spend for user growth as well as support for merchants. So once again, they continue to reinvest into the China commerce business, especially into those low density cities or tier four cities as they described in their investor day. And that's where the majority of the growth is going to be. This is what we're expecting overall. Two, they recorded the consolidation of Sun Art in October of 20, where 
it's less revenue and the cost of inventory are mainly recorded on a gross basis. So that seems to be mainly more of an accounting thing and I'm not gonna say more about that than I already have. Moving into number three, they expect China commerce adjusted EBITDA margin will continue to be affected by the growth of their direct sales business. And so effectively what they're saying is their direct sales business is a lower margin business. And so as you forecast out the operating margins for this segment, be very careful to not forecast out historical margins. You're gonna overshoot on earnings that way. Now, moving into international commerce, some of you guys are not familiar with all of the international businesses, and so you can see from here that their global brand is AliExpress, their Southeast Asia brand is Lazada, their Turkey brand is Trendyol, their Duraz brand is Pakistan, and of course you can see here, international business grew by 25% in revenue year over year. So that's really good, but of course you can see their EBITDA margin declined by 82% to a negative 15%. So overall, huge growth in revenue, and let's dissect that revenue a little bit more. So you can see here that international commerce retail grew at 24%, and their international commerce wholesale grew at 28% for an overall growth of 25%. So international growth on the revenue side is firing on all cylinders, which is really good to see because once again, international expansion is very important for Alibaba, especially as they operate in a challenged Chinese economy. And you can see here that they surpassed my expectations. At the beginning of the year, or I guess last year when I made this expectations, I said that international segment could struggle. Baba is not the strongest internationally. I still hold by that, but you can see here that they have continued to prove me wrong with their international business, and hopefully the momentum continues, but hopefully also we see the momentum on the bottom line as well. But overall, I don't think I'm going to take up my expectations for the international segment. This has gone up and down historically, so I'm going to leave my expectations where they are. And you can see they talk more about their businesses here so this is essentially a story about Lazada carrying more than its weight in the fast growing Southeast Asia market against some tough competition in other words Shopee which is partially owned by Tencent and so they go and say that the increase was mainly attributable to growth in revenue generated by Lazada now here's the thing that we were able to predict they're saying that international growth was negatively impacted by the depreciation of the Turkish lira against the renminbi on Trendial. And that's something that we did predict in past quarters when we said that inflation is running high in Trendial. And although they were doing well in those quarters, I did point out in the videos that you could see challenges in Turkey and now you're starting to see it. Also, AliExpress was affected by the change in the European Union value added tax rules, which is something that we experienced in previous quarters. So nothing new there as well as they experienced supply chain and logistics disruptions due to the Russia Ukraine conflict. So Nothing really unexpected here. We sort of expected all of these impacts. I'm just happy to see that Lazada is doing very well. And moving on to their international commerce wholesale business, you can see that once again, they just stated that the increase was primarily due to increases in both the average revenue from paying members and the number of paying members on Alibaba.com, as well as an increase in revenue generated by cross-border related value added services. So I want them to stop teasing me here and just tell me what these are and that's what I'm gonna sort of dig into further and I'll let you guys know once I figure it out. Now the one thing that I really wanna to mention to you guys is that this video is just part one of a four part series on Alibaba's year end results. And so in the next video, I'm gonna break down Alibaba's cloud computing business, which will be part two of four. And then in part three of four, I'm gonna break down their options chain analysis. So what sort of opportunities exist to reduce risk for value investors? And then in part four, once they release their annual report, which will come in July, I'm gonna build a brand new Alibaba model, which I'll provide to everyone. And so in order to not miss out on any of those videos, guys, go down and hit that subscribe button right now and ring that notification bell to be notified when those videos become available. Now, let's dive right into their valuation. So you can see here that although I haven't updated my valuation, I will be revamping the model once the annual report is released. I don't expect the valuation to change materially. I think it'll likely fall in that $250 to $300 range. So that effectively reflects a continued strong upside on the current share price of $93 per share. But of course, as I've always told you guys, Alibaba is not the only name in the game. You can see here, from the tracker that the Patreons have access at that $5 per month level, you can see that there's six names that are strong companies in the tracker that are trading for under 50% of their intrinsic value. 
Also, guys, just know that the tracker auto updates with the market movements to show in near real time opportunities that open up, such as Alphabet trading near 50% of its intrinsic value. Additionally, there's 20 names of strong companies in the tracker trading at near 50% of their intrinsic value. And as we see more weakness in the market, which is what I expect, some of these names are going to start trading under 50% of their intrinsic value. I really want to pick up Alphabet at under $2,000 per share. And I'm not just going to be watching the share price, but I'm also going to be watching the yields on the cash secured puts to pick this up in any way that I can. And also note on the tracker, every single ticker contains a link that takes you into a full detailed model for that security. For example, notice that I've highlighted in that red box, the Facebook ticker. Well, when you click into that ticker, it takes you into this full model for Meta. And best of all, you can download the models and change every single input at the most granular level to suit your personal expectations. More models are being added each week as well as updates to the current names. So what am I really saying here? I'm saying that you can access all of that at just the $5 a month tier level. And like I always say, if you decide that it's not for you and you don't want it, message me in Patreon before that first month ends and let me know that it's not for you and I'll fully refund that first month for you. No questions asked, so there's zero risk to you. And with that said, what's really important for you guys is to check out my Alibaba first look video, which covered the whole sort of results in a first look context, which you can get to right here.